In a remote corner of Canada, an amazing secret is being revealed. An animal that modern science had no idea existed. A new culture of wolves. Once the Earth's greatest four-legged land predator roamed the entire northern hemisphere. But its relationship with humans is like oil and water, and for centuries it was the wolf who became the hunted. Everywhere, that is, except here. This is a place where you're not likely to be killed by a human being, in great contrast to everywhere else where wolves still exist today. They may not be living exactly as they were two, three thousand years ago, but what has evolved has been a natural evolution. Lost in time, in one of the last wild places on Earth, is it possible that here, and only here, wolves still live the way wolves once everywhere did? How unique are they? How have they survived? What are the secrets of the coast wolf? On the extreme edge of northwest British Columbia, the Pacific Ocean collides with the coast mountains to create a global hotspot of biodiversity. Hugging 500 kilometers of coastline are the most pristine rainforests left in North America and an archipelago of over a thousand islands. It is one of nature's final frontiers. But so far, no one really knows what here is. It has never been fully studied by science. For the past decade, Ian McAllister, a founder of the Rain Coast Conservation Society, has navigated thousands of kilometers of this coastline, fighting to save these ancient rainforests from industrial logging. His preferred weapon is science, and uses it to learn how this poorly understood ecosystem works, and when it doesn't. When we first started work up here, it was really based on exploration. There was a uh, you know, fair amount of work being done on salmon, the yearly counts of salmon, but for virtually all of the terrestrial uh, components to this coastline, there was very, very little information. At over 60,000 square kilometers, this is an area larger than Ireland, so it's easy to understand why information was scarce. Rain Coast first decided to study grizzly bears, a key species and an entry point to understanding the entire ecosystem. But instead of answers, they discovered a new mystery. We realized that there were some big gaps in our knowledge, in particular the, the outer coastal island areas. And the reason for that is that we would have grizzly bear biologists working in these valleys, and they wouldn't see any grizzly bears, they would be seeing wolves. Okay, there's three really easy, almost primary. What puzzled them most was how the wolves got there. But really this conflict exists with the forest companies. Some islands were 15 kilometers from the mainland and it was thought that wolves didn't like to swim. It was a mystery begging for an answer. And so in 2000, McAllister, along with Dr. Paul Paquette, one of the world's leading wolf experts, and Chris Derrimont, a biologist at the University of Victoria, spearheaded the Rainforest Wolf Project. We think that the, historically the coastal wolf was probably found uh, from northern California uh, to southeastern Alaska. What makes this place so special is that those wolves uh, uh, are still here. And they're here in, in uh, pretty much intact habitat uh, that we can't find anywhere else. Wind's in our favor and the rain really keeps the smell uh, close to the ground and doesn't move around too much. So it's uh, maybe a good, good time to see some wolves. It would become the most comprehensive study of its kind. Hundreds of days were spent in the field, but what really excited these scientists was how the coast wolf had adapted to the sea. I've never seen wolves elsewhere swim the way that the wolves here do and do it regularly and, and seem seemingly without concern. 
And it's because water is so uh, predominant in their environment, it's everywhere, and, and they've adapted to it. Wolves everywhere in the world like to move. In North America, they've been known to travel up to 100,000 square kilometers to find food or a mate. Here, they just learned how to swim for it. But the coast wolf's amazing adaptation to water didn't begin or end on a beach. Before the work we did, nobody had systematically cataloged what the uh, wolves were doing and uh, how uh, effective they were at fishing and so on. That, and that's a, a new contribution. And what we found is that they're very, very good preying on uh, spawning salmon. The scientists also learned that fishing season was the perfect time to observe wolves in the open. The annual salmon spawn is a time of detente between animals. Everything is focused on fattening up for winter, and the feast is endless. But coast wolves, it seems, are picky eaters. If this uh, fish is swimming up the creek, wolves will just trot in and grab right here with their teeth uh, and just yank, you know, up to a 10, 15, 20 pound salmon out of the creek and it's still writhing back and forth and they'll flop it down they'll put their paws on it and they'll just, they'll just open it right up and take off the head. The scientists believe that they ate only the heads to avoid harmful parasites in the body. It was more evidence of a long-term relationship between wolves and the sea. But how long had it been here? find out, they had to travel back in time. We actually follow in the footsteps of wolves, pick up what they leave behind these scaps, and extract and amplify the DNA to ask questions about their evolutionary history and about which wolf was here, where, and when. DNA, the double helix of the genetic code, the fundamental building block of life. What could it reveal about the secret life of the coast wolf? On the remote northwest coast of British Columbia, researchers had spent years unlocking the secrets of a new culture of wolves. Part of their success was due to some unique non-invasive study techniques. In the past, science had often relied on traps or tranquilizers to study animals up close. But Paul Paquette and Chris Daramont believed that seeing wasn't everything. To learn even more, they collected scat-based DNA. In the human world, genetic fingerprinting has proven everything from guilt or innocence to the birth parents of a lost child. In the wolf world, Thousands of scat samples were collected to help determine population sizes, how often wolves travel between islands, even its evolutionary history. Many people wonder, well, how on earth is there DNA in, in scat? And what happens when the food that the wolf has eaten makes its way through the digestive tract? It picks up cells from the intestinal lining, and out those cells come with the scat. So in the scat here, there are literally thousands of, of skin cells uh, from the wolf. And of course, in every cell is the DNA. But this is the first stage of a, of a complicated process. The second stage is a thousand miles and a world far removed from the British Columbia coast. 
Here, Jennifer Leonard, a geneticist at the University of California in Los Angeles, uses more cutting-edge science to decipher secrets hidden in the coast wolf's DNA. Once we get the feces in the lab, we first extract DNA from the feces, and then we take that and we can sequence it and read each base pair individually. Um, and once we get all those sequences, we can compare them with the other wolves from all over the world. It was the ultimate secret. Researchers knew the coast wolf was unique, but to find out how unique it really was, Leonard analyzed sequences in its genetic code called haplotypes. Um, a haplotype is just a version of uh, genetic material, usually DNA. Um, in this case, what we're studying is the mitochondrial DNA, which is a kind of DNA that's only passed from the mother to all of her children. Inside the womb, as cells replicate during reproduction, genetic code in the mother's mitochondrial DNA is transferred. As this cycle repeats itself over thousands of years, mutations occur and are inherited as a new haplotype. More haplotypes in the DNA of an animal population means the more genetically diverse it is, something that can only occur undisturbed in the wild over a long period of time. But wolves have been hunted for centuries, and although genetic fingerprinting has identified 35 different haplotypes, as populations decreased, so did the number of mothers. So far, the largest number of haplotypes found in a single population is five, and that made Leonard's results incredible, almost impossible. All of Canada and Alaska that's been surveyed only have five haplotypes. So finding 14 haplotypes in just the coastal wolves of BC was very surprising. Uh, we expected one and maybe two haplotypes, and having 14 was vastly beyond what we imagined. All these are North American wolves. The results didn't prove the coast wolf had changed. Incredibly, they proved that it hadn't. But it had changed in the rest of North America, where hunting and habitat loss had decimated populations. It is becoming more clear that the, the state of very high genetic diversity that we find in British Columbia is most likely the ancestral state, and that it isn't that the British Columbian wolves are strangely high in genetic diversity, but that the other populations are strangely low. It was stunning clinical proof of what had been observed in the field, an ancient wolf living in the 21st century. But why here? As wild as it is, humans have lived here too for thousands of years. Except that here, a unique relationship exists between wolves and humans. They share the same territory, and wolves are not hunted for any reason. We're all related to wolves. If I come into the company of a wolf, um, I'm not to harm it. I'm to speak to it, even if from my heart. And I'm to explain to it why I'm, I'm in its company. And I ask it for protection. We uh, regard them as our brothers and our sisters. working hypothesis uh, at this time is that these wolves have maintained genetic diversity because they've not been persecuted to the extent of uh, wolves and other wolves in North America and throughout the world. It was something that couldn't be said about wolves anywhere else. This is a different wolf. They've sort of gone on their own evolutionary route here on the coast. There's probably hundreds or thousands of other taxa or organisms that are also different on the coast. So in that way, the wolves become uh, an entry point to understanding a bigger system. 
But after an exhaustive study of the Coast Wolf, scientists are now in a race against time to protect this entire ecosystem. 50% of the British Columbia coast has already been logged. Soon, it could happen here too. When you consider that the, this is the, the genetic evolution, or the product of genetic evolution spanning uh, uh, 70, 80 million years, and, and yet we can take down so much forest in, in such a short period of time, um, that, that definitely feels wrong. Nowhere else in the world does an intact wolf culture exist. But as rare as it is, just like its home range, the last temperate rainforest on Earth, is this where it will make its final stand? It was time to leave science behind and explore on our own the secret world of nature's greatest land predator. Raw, remote, and so far almost untouched by humans, British Columbia's northwest coast may be the most pristine ecosystem on Earth. There are no roads, and the forest canopy is too thick, so our search for the coast wolf will be done exclusively by boat. The scientists who studied wolves here spent almost five years and traveled thousands of kilometers. Our crew has only a few weeks to find and film these rare, elusive animals. It's a tough challenge. Wolves are notoriously difficult to film. They travel vast distances, rarely stay in one place long, and are extremely nervous of any human contact. The home range of the coast wolf may be unique, but there are no guarantees they will be in the same locations they were studied last year. Traveling deep into this Thousand Island archipelago is a journey back in time. On the surface, it's easy to understand how these wolves have withstood the impacts of progress. Here, it seems, everything has. Rugged, primitive, and extremely difficult to access, it's too isolated for hunting and still too expensive to log. It's a wild, ancient world where time, it seems, has literally stood still. Once old-growth northern boreal rainforests, the rarest forest type on Earth, carpeted the entire west coast from California to Alaska. Today, the last virgin stands of Sitka spruce and western red cedar exist only here. Some are over a thousand years old. As far as we know, wolves have lived here too for about 10,000 years. However, new science has suggested that the last great ice age may have missed the far western edge of North America. So it's possible that they've lived here even longer. We've traveled north for over a week, and every promising sight has been a disappointment. Evidence of wolves is everywhere, but there are no fresh tracks or kills. Now the first big storm of the fall is brewing in the Pacific, and our crew is getting frustrated. But at least now, it's also obvious why this coastal ecosystem is one massive rainforest. They land on an island about a kilometer from the mainland, and our cameraman, a veteran wildlife cinematographer, decides to try a howl. And suddenly, there they are, an alpha male and two curious teenagers. Their fur is the ochre color unique to the coast wolf. Healthy but nervous, they retreat quickly into the forest as soon as they catch our scent. It's unlikely they'll be back. After a hundred tough, wet kilometers, a 30-second glimpse is no success at all. 
And so the crew continues north to an island they've heard of near Canada's border with Alaska. This island is almost 20 kilometers from the mainland, an almost impossible distance. But as science has already confirmed, this wolf likes to swim and fish for its dinner. It's also possible that they rode the tides to travel this far out, and now it may be too far to swim back. Finally, our crew finds the evidence they've been looking for, fresh salmon carcass. There are wolves here, and they've been fishing on this estuary today. By nightfall, an observation blind has been set up, and the crew settles in. Suddenly, the wait is over. In the black of night, our cameraman is caught off guard. He's alone in the blind, and it seems that the resident wolves have decided to let this intruder know whose territory this is. Okay, I've got these wolves surrounding me here. There's five wolves, and they're not afraid of me. He may have a night vision camera, but he's still at a distinct disadvantage. I've got the night vision on, I bear spray one of them, and they're still circling. They're probably the only other large mammal here other than the wolves. It may be the first time wolves anywhere have been filmed at night, behavior never observed before, and these wolves are behaving boldly. It's an unexpected, unnerving success, and for the rest of this night, there will be no sleep. that live on this small island outpost. This estuary is the source of all life. It looks as if a family of four wolves lives here. An adult, or alpha male, two females, and a lone pup. They know our camera is located just across the estuary, but clearly they don't seem to care. If they did, they'd be invisible. but this pack looks relaxed. They're the ones in charge here. In the fall, life on this island is as good as it gets. A time when wolves can eat, sleep, and play all day. Wolves are extremely social, and family is everything. Playtime reinforces the bond and relieves any tensions in the pack. Since time began here, life on the estuary has depended on two constant primordial rhythms, the rise and fall of the sun and the tides. On average, these are 23-foot tides, rising and falling every six hours. At over four feet an hour, water rushes in and out constantly. Only at the peak of high tide does the ocean seem to take a break. It's a rare moment of calm and a good time for harp seals to navigate upstream to fish. While ducks, geese, and many other shorebirds patiently wait for the inevitable. the ocean rushes out again. This intertidal zone between land and sea is a rich feeding ground. 
It's good hunting for the birds, although shellfish stranded by the tide always make for a challenging meal. For about eight months of the year, the wolves here are also quite capable of scrounging a meal from these shallow tidal pools. But in the fall, they too feast in the stream. Every study of the coast wolf has revealed the same thing. Although the bulk of their diet is similar to their continental cousins, like all animals here, they eat a lot of salmon. Coast wolves will hunt deer, even bear. But on this island, where they seem to be the only large land mammals, without this annual surge of salmon, they couldn't survive. And right now, this stream is packed with them, eager to spawn. After a four-year journey across thousands of kilometers of Pacific Ocean, these mature salmon are exhausted and the wolves pick them off with ease. In the native legends of the Northwest, it is the raven who brought light to the world, breathed life into man, and convinced the salmon to come to this coast. Now the raven watches the wolf closely, who, in tribute, always leaves it a meal. Thousands of years of evolution has taught the great blue heron to stand perfectly still and wait for a fish to come to it. And so does this adult female. These salmon weigh about 15 pounds, but the wolves make quick work of them, puncturing the skull and killing them instantly. As science has confirmed, they eat only the heads. Some think it's because they can't digest parasites in the body cavity, but the head does contain the highest fat content. As fearless as they are, the adults have remained protective of their pup and kept it far away from our camera. But it's not just these new, unknown intruders that worry them. The alpha male has spied a lone wolf entering the estuary. It's probably just looking for a free lunch but the Alpha is in no mood to share his fish. They may have fought before, or perhaps the lone wolf is naturally cautious. Either way, he won't confront the Alpha today. An Alpha will defend his pack or territory against any intruder. It's another behavior that's rarely been filmed, and incredibly, this Alpha knows we're watching. Once again, after dark, the wolves grow even more confident. Darkness is their true domain, and if our crew is smart, they'll retreat to their tent and wait for morning. But before they can react, the pack is back. We've got the pack of wolves here again. And they're creeping around here somewhere. It's all right. You're okay. Let's be friends. You settle down. Twigs snapping. Of course, around my tent. Get, get out of here. More than any other animal, the wolf is a creature of myth and mystery. From the Grimm brothers to Walt Disney, the big bad wolf has had a unique grip in our imagination. But in the native legends of coastal British Columbia, wolves are neither wicked nor violent. One legend tells the tale of a hunter who lived on these islands. Every night he left his wife, only to return at dawn with fresh game. His wife wondered why he was such a great hunter, 
and soon learned he could transform himself into a wolf, the supreme hunter of the night. At night, wolves are indeed transformed. In a world dependent on scent and sound, their amazing eyesight makes nighttime their time. It's now pitch black. Wolves have never been filmed feeding at night, and they go about their business as if it were broad daylight, hunting, fishing, and eating. The wolfman's wife bore him four children, all wolves. But one night, she heard laughter in her home. The pups had removed their fur cloaks and become human. The woman felt deceived that her children, too, could be transformed, and in her anger, she threw three furs into the fire. The fourth pup escaped and became the coast wolf. But the others, with no fur for warmth or strong jaws and swift feet, remained merely human. At night, in the company of wolves, it's easy to feel merely human. Where? Can you see with that camera? Hey, wolf, hey, wolf. Just, just chill, just chill, just chill. Just get the bear spray ready. No other animal would investigate humans like this, actively, curiously, and in total control. Oh, my God. Here, perhaps only here, the historic relationship between wolves and humans has been reversed. Because here, it's the human's turn to be wary of the wolves. Just chill, just chill. Is she growling? No. That was a growl, dude. Okay, yeah, yeah. Watch my back. See her? Yeah, yeah. Watch that. Oh. That's the one. Where? Right here. Got her. For a lot of reasons, sunrise is now our camera crew's favorite time of day. It's also low tide, and with the salmon exposed and vulnerable, eagles and shorebirds have arrived right on time. And so have the wolves. But today is different. For the first time, the whole pack has come to fish as a family. This female is the pack teenager. She's at least two years old, but still an awkward hunter. Young coast wolves have a much lower mortality rate than wolves on the continent, but they still need to eat about three times as much protein as adults. The rich seafood diet here explains a lot about their high survival rate. But fishing skills are not instinctive. The alpha male shows his daughter how it's done. Wolves are the most intelligent of all land predators, but they still need to learn how to be wolves. And this teenager is learning well. Physically, an adult wolf is the size of a large dog, but a lot leaner. These are endurance animals built for the long distance kill. Packs hunt by running their prey down pursuing it until it's too exhausted to resist. But for a coast wolf, at least during the salmon run, there's no need for a long hunt. Here, the fishing is very good. The pup of the pack is about a year old, and he has a lot to learn. Right now, he doesn't even want to get his feet wet. His mother waits and watches patiently. Like all mothers, she knows he can do it. 
and she's right. He quickly dashes across and gets a warm nip of approval as a reward. The mother too is a proficient deadly hunter. Now it's the pup's turn to watch closely and then practice his own technique. Adults can go days without eating, but when they can, they will eat up to one-fifth their body weight, or about 18 pounds at one time. To survive the lean winter months ahead, gorging now could make the difference between life or death. But in good times or bad, a pack will rarely fight over food. And adults will never snatch food from a pup. If this one doesn't catch on soon and start fishing on his own, he too might not survive. Odds are he will, just like his sister has. Wolves are nature's prime social carnivores. Its behavior totally unique to wolves. For all others on this island, it's everyone for himself. No one knows how long this pack has been here, but as long as it has, it's depended on the sea for survival. It's the living proof our crew was looking for of a unique ancient culture of wolves alive and well on Canada's remote northwest coast. After weeks filming wolves on a tiny island in the remote northwest corner of British Columbia, our camera crew is starting to believe that it's the wolves who are watching them. The best example so far of their uncanny competence is to allow their pup to play exposed and in broad daylight. It's clear these wolves have no reflex of fear of humans, but we're not so sure that our humans still don't have a reflex of fear of wolves. Fall is advancing rapidly towards winter, while the salmon run is slowing down. Spawned out and exhausted, they make an easy meal. Another scientific breakthrough here is a new understanding of the contribution salmon make to the health of the rainforest itself. As their carcasses rot, nutrients, especially nitrogen, are deposited in the soil. This annual exchange between land and sea is a good reason why these rainforests are so fertile. The pup too has progressed quickly, and this fish is the first he's caught all on his own. If he's going to fatten up to survive the winter ahead, he needs to hurry up and catch even more. Soon enough, the spawn will end, and all the wolves here are now eating as much as they can. A wolf's natural life is about 10 years, but many die prematurely from disease or infection. They can bleed to death from a cut on the tongue. A sharp fish bone or a porcupine quill can infect and kill them. As a result, it's quite possible that by spring, it will be the young wolves who survived. For now, all their parents can do is teach them everything they can, as fast as they can. Wolves use three known methods of communication. Howling, posturing, like baring their teeth, and scent marking. Scent marking is poorly understood by science. We think it's used to warn both the pack and intruders where a home territory begins and ends. 
But if this message delivered personally is too subtle for our crew, the Alpha has another way of letting us know whose island this is. The crew has set up this microphone to record the natural sound of the estuary. The jaws of a wolf can exert a crushing pressure of 1,500 pounds per square inch, more than twice that of a large dog. Hey, go eat the fish. The manual doesn't say how much pressure the microphone can resist, but we're pretty sure it's less than 1,500 pounds. The Alpha makes short work of it. It's a $5,000 meal. sets the microphone up a second time and again the Alpha approaches. But this time, he's figured it out. To claim his prize, he needs to cut the microphone cable. It's another amazing display of behavior and intelligence. It's also the clearest message yet that wolves are the dominant species here. But after sunset, the pack has another surprise. Don't be surprised if they come around tonight. Almost every night, our crew has had an unnerving visit from the pack that's made sleep a luxury. The weather hasn't helped either. Their main night vision camera has been damaged by rain and salt water. Now a single backup camera is all they have left. What's that noise? But tonight, the pack isn't interested in the crew. They're interested in the crew's inflatable Zodiac. Where? Holy shit. He's going to town on the Zodiac. Grab the handheld. For hose from the boat. Yeah, this guy looks to chew on shit. He's just sending messages. Where's the other one? Whoa. How you doing, big guy? Hey there. You're a pretty wolf. Stand by. Stand by. Hang on. Okay, I think the show's over. Now it's the crew's turn to be curious. Why would the wolves attack their boat? Chewed up microphones, a damaged Zodiac. We may have just worn out our welcome. And the next morning, it is over. Time to let these wolves get on with simply being wolves. Their future, however, remains a big question mark. But if humans don't empty these waters of salmon or destroy these rainforests with commercial logging, or a natural disaster or disease doesn't upset their island paradise, then they just might survive. The coast wolf is the rarest wolf on Earth. 
because isolation has allowed it to live just as it has for thousands of years. But ironically, its best chance to survive thousands more will be with the help of something uniquely human, a bit of luck. <laughs>